Um, welcome everyone to panel seven, Ooh, loud. Um, vision for people. Um, our topic today is how, how do we endure fair, how do we ensure fair access to resources and increase resilience across communities? How can we prepare current and future generations to face the impacts of climate change? And today we have an amazing um, group of panelists. We have Angie Oberg, assistant teaching professor in the Department of Human Ecology um, at Rutgers. We have Andrea Marston, assistant professor in the Department of Geography from Rutgers. We have Torsten Weichmann, who is continuing to be part of this panel discussion. And that was a wonderful um, talk today. Thank you for that. Um, and Tobias Fox, who is managing director of Newark Science and Sustainability, who brings in a, an application um, that is doing amazing work in Newark. And so with that, I will hand this over to Angie. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Good morning and good morning to those who are online. Very happy to be here. Um, so I'll just start by saying I have I completely reworked this presentation. Um, I had made one that hewed very closely to the data and I realized that I wasn't following the assignment as I tell my students read the assignment. This was not about data. This was about a vision for how we can do things differently for people and how we can make that better. So I hope you will allow me some latitude as I point to data that supports the things I want you to believe about what I'm going to say. Right? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start with some observations that I've seen in the United States. Um, at the national political level about infrastructure. So I just grabbed some headlines. Um, and those who follow, you don't have to follow this. I just want to make a few points about this. But those who follow, there is this fierce debate going on about what are we going to do? People have called it all sorts of different things. But this is sort of what I'm going to talk about today. So this headline says, Democrats say human infrastructure bill will rebuild the American middle class. And so this is when they had introduced a very large bill that included all sorts of things that people didn't necessarily think were infrastructure, and that's why they use the term human infrastructure. Um, and as you can imagine, as we like to do in the US, we fought about that. And uh, so, so there are folks who said, the people have spoken and infrastructure means bridges and roads. This human infrastructure thing is nonsense. And so the bill was cleaved into two separate bills, and now we have these bizarre things called the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the reconciliation bill, which mean absolutely nothing to anyone who's not paying attention, right? Those words mean nothing. Um, but the reason I picked these three headlines is because they're all talking about this word infrastructure. Um, and it, it's very inert. It's kind of a benign word. And what I'm going to argue today is that we need to stop focusing on infrastructure alone. Infrastructure is a tool to do something to do something. And that thing is to usually deliver services and it's to deliver services to people. And we've had this blind spot about the fact that the goal is to deliver services. We've had this myopic vision of just infrastructure and that is where a lot of our failure derives from. So um, I'm gonna use my data from India. This is a part of a much larger project. So I very much cherry pick, I'm gonna own that I cherry picked data. For this, um, I'm happy to talk about the data in more detail, but um, I think that the Indian context in terms of sewage, which is what I'm going to talk about today, is very applicable to the things that we're talking about in the US. And so as we globalize, I think that we can see the divisions between the global north and the global south really start to blur, and we can learn a lot from each other. Um, if, if we're willing to. So this is now Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, while he was campaigning in 2013. And he famously said in a very public setting, Pahele Suchalia Fir Diwalia, which loosely translates to first toilets, then temples. So he is viewed as the, uh, as the Hindu leader of India. And so this was a really big thing for him to say. And basically what he was saying is, India has a huge sanitation problem and we need to deal with that before we build more temples, right? What is the point of, of worshiping in a world or in a, in a country that is filled with sewage? But his response to this was to focus on the toilet, right? He was focusing on, let's build a bunch of toilets. There are a lot of initi initiatives that come with that, but this was his public statement. Again, focusing on the infrastructure, again, acknowledging the problem, but then immediately assuming that the answer was, let's build some stuff. All right, so here's a really quick picture of the infrastructure situation in India. Um, so since, let me get the date here, since two, uh, 1986, we have spent over 3 billion US dollars on building toilets in India, and yet, and this is the real, this is the real and yet, this is where the disconnect comes in, and yet, 70% of the people do not use improved sanitation services. And yet, less than 30% of the toilets are connected to sewage services. So even if we build those latrines that Narendra Modi is so insistent on, 
we're not necessarily delivering sewage services because those latrines might not be connected to anything that is then cleaning the sewage. Okay, so that's the situation. So my question was, what is going on here? This was just sort of my basic question of how did we get this disconnect where we're investing so much time, so much money, and we're getting, it's on the agenda. The, the PM, the prime minister is saying this in public, it's on the agenda, uh, and yet, and yet these are the statistics. So what's going on? So to answer this question, I looked at, is there a, there's a laser pointer on here, right? Aha. Uh -huh. All right, so this is India, and my site here was Agra. And so this is the Golden Triangle. I'm going to go quickly here after this. This is the Golden Triangle uh, in, in northern India, and this is the Yamuna River. So I just want to illustrate how close this is to the capital and that it's along a major river. So the Yamuna, the Yamuna River, uh, this is its confluence with the Ganga here, and then the Ganga flows uh, into the Bay of Bengal uh, right, near, um, right near that. The mouth. Okay, so we're looking in northern India. It's in the state of Uttar Pradesh, but right on the corner. So it's right on the edge of um, the Rajasthani Desert, but it's on a major waterway. Okay, and so why is Agra so interesting? This is an image of all of the World Heritage Monuments and other ASI or the Agric uh, Archaeological Survey of India protected sites. And so this is a huge tour tourist destination. In fact, um, the Taj Mahal right here. So this is the River Yamuna. The Taj Mahal is the most visited site in all of India for both uh, domestic and foreign tourists. Uh, on my last trip there, the Obamas were supposed to be there the next week, and the city was abuzz. So they get dignitaries from all over the world. Um, and because it's so visible, both internally and externally, there was a huge push to clean it up. There's sewage everywhere. Um, and so th this is what I was interested in. What are we going to do in this place that's so visible and there's a huge interest, right? So this isn't a, a forgotten place. This is a place where there's a lot of attention. All right. So I please don't read all of these. Um, my point is simply that these are the different policy initiatives that were addressing sewage in some way in the city. And the point is that there are all the way from national level initiatives to citywide initiatives down to district level. So this wasn't an issue of we're not looking at this at, at the municipal level or we're not looking at this at the national level. And so in addition to this sort of reasons that these exist, it also means that these are streams of money. So whenever I see a policy initiative and I see like USAID next to it, I just see dollar signs. Right. So someone is pumping money into this. This is where that $3 billion in, in uh, US uh, funding for toilets comes from. All right, but what I really want to highlight here, whoops, is that in each of these um, policy initiatives, oh, should I move this? Oh, I can't say that. Okay, so in each of these policy initiatives, that banner that you can't see behind that black box is that success is equated with infrastructure construction. So for anyone who's gotten money from a government, which um, <laughs> is, is nice but fraught, um, you have to write a report. What did you do with all that money? And you get a, a big gold star if you built something. So the USAID will say, here, you know, here's $100,000 and then you have to write a report saying, what did you do? And you get the pat on the back and you get the gold star if you build something. And so infrastructure construction is su what success looks like to all of these funders, to all these initiatives. And in fact, the Yamuna Action Plan, that, that was 100% about building infrastructure to protect the Yamuna. Um, and it was usually sewage treatment plants. Okay, so what did this look like on the ground? Did my, oh my not pointing it towards its, can I advance the slide? Oh, I did advance the slide. All right, so one of the things that was, uh, one of the main initiatives, the infrastructure initiatives was sewage treatment plants. So this is good. Remember I said um, only 30% of the latrines are connected to sewage services. So it makes sense, let's build some sewage treatment plants. So these are the four sewage plants in the dark red color. The pink are freshwater intake for drinking water to be treated. So those four darker spots are sewage treatment plants. The issue is, is that the northernmost and southernmost are underutilized. So they could take more capacity, but they aren't. Um, and then the two that you see that are closest just sort of to the center, central part, the midline of the city, those are overburdened. And so what that means in sum is that the four sewage treatment plants are only at about two thirds capacity. So we have this situation where, and, and the ones that are overburdened are way overburdened. Um, there's a whole issue between open channels and water logging that's, that's upstream, that's a whole other issue. Um, but this is where we see things like sewage and solid waste 
coming together to really make a difference. Um, but so in this case, the infrastructure was built, and even if these were operating at 100% capacity, it would not be sufficient for the city. Um, but as it is, the things that are built are not being utilized properly. And yet, the money that they got from the Yaman Action Plan to build these, you know, gold star, good job, well done. All right, and so this is going to be a theme. I, I promise I'm going to end on a good note. This isn't all going to just be like how, how we're terrible at everything. Um, so this is a map, the, the pink sort of polygons here are the slums and slum is a term that is designated by the municipality so they determine they're called designated slums and they're based on access to services this is another question sidebar about how we determine what slums are if the people who aren't providing the services are making the designation there's a there's a problem there anyway that's a sidebar uh, so these are the designated slums and then the the dots are the public toilets so community toilet blocks are a really common tool that aid organizations use, they'll go into a community and they'll build community uh, toilet blocks. Again, obviously through these programs and um, slum up programs and funding, but when you look at the, so at the map level, it looks like maybe we need some more, but the distribution is pretty good. So we just need to sort of scale up what we're already doing. So from a planning perspective, you might think, okay, let's put more money into this program because it seems to be working, right? We're getting a good distribution. But when you look at the actual toilets, in person, they're not functioning the way they're supposed to. And I'm, I'm sorry, I hope everyone's done eating. Um, I, use, I use this picture <laughs> partially to shock people because I think it's useful for, to un, for us to understand what we're talking about. People, these are people. And what I'm really interested in is how do we, what is the lived experience? And when we're talking about infrastructure, it's not these inert things like build roads and bridges. They are things that are delivering services to humans. And so how can we allow people to live with dignity? Um, and so building a toilet is not sufficient to be a dot on a map when the toilet that you've built for them looks like this. Um, and there's, this is a complicated picture. Um, I could teach a whole class just on this picture, um, and I'm happy to talk about it later. Uh, the, the thing that I will say is that we can look at this and, and have a reaction, which I expect that you will. Um, but I, I'd also like to say that um, I usually, when I when I show this picture to my undergraduates, I have an associated picture, which is the Macy's on 34th Street in Manhattan at Christmas time with a picture of the women's bathroom line. So when we think that, oh, well, we're doing so much better at providing toilet services to ourselves, we're not. This is, again, an infrastructure question. When you're building infrastructure and you have equal stalls for men and women, you're not thinking about the people that are, you're not delivering the service. You're just building the toilet or the urinal. Um, all right, that's my, my, my gender toilet rant is something aside. So the whole point is dot on the map, gold star, but this is what it looks like on the ground. This is not sufficient. Okay, so what am I really, this is gonna, I'm gonna give myself some time to talk about this. So this is, uh, <laughs> this is the famous treachery of images by Rene Magritte. Um, and he was a, a Belgian surrealist painter. And this is the, in French underneath it says, this is not a pipe. And I, I love this image because it is everything that I think about infrastructure. So it's, it's sort of confusing. This is not like, obviously, it's a pipe. The point is that this is not a pipe because you can't smoke it. A pipe, by definition, is something that you smoke. <laughs> if we're talking about pipes in another sense as infrastructure, a pipe is something through which water flows. And so in another space, I didn't show this because it was really hard to show graphically. Uh, there's a neighborhood that is considered 100% sewered, which means that there are sewer lines underneath all of the city, and yet none of those sewer lines are connected to household toilets. So are those actually sewer lines? So according to Rene Magritte, they're representations of sewer lines because they're not conveying sewage. So I just keep this picture in my head to say, as we're building these infrastructure things, and we call this a fill in the blank with whatever, if it's not providing the service, is it really that thing or is it just a representation of that thing? Um, and the way that we, the way that we think about this, I think it's hard. So the question that I ask myself is, am I just being an annoying academic splitting hairs about the words that we use? Maybe a little bit, I'm sorry. Um, this is my philosophy degree that rears its ugly head every now and then, but it matters. And here's why I think it matters. So if we take a shift, uh, we shift our focus away from this physical infrastructure, I think that we can have different ways to, to plan and evaluate. So I completely understand the benefit from a political perspective of building something. You get to go to a groundbreaking and wear like the hat and like have the gold shovel or like you get to cut a ribbon over a bridge, you get to get reelected, we're all happy. I understand the politics behind it. 
but that's because we have, as, as a society have decided to value that. So if we didn't care that so-and-so mayor or whoever was at a ribbon cutting, then they wouldn't value that, right? So we've decided that that's something that's valuable. Now, if we shift towards a focus on service delivery and away from what I think of is just like, I think of it as the myopia of toilets because I'm sewage obsessed, but any infrastructure, I think this fits any infrastructure, then we start to evaluate programs or policies um, with a focus on people. We're not asking, did we build a bridge? We're asking, are people able to traverse this landscape? We're not asking, did we build a sewage treatment plant? We asked, are we treating the sewage in the city? There are different kinds of questions. And again, it sounds like I'm splitting hairs, but what it does also is it acknowledges that different people have different lived experiences. So if a service that we're delivering is clean water, that might be different for people in different situations. If the pipes in your home have lead, then you getting clean water looks different than someone that has a house that doesn't have lead in their pipes. And so we're asking different kinds of questions and acknowledging that it's not the existence of pipes and water that matters, it's the person getting the service of clean water. We're asking different questions, which allows us to evaluate things different. And finally, what it does is it requires different kinds of solutions. Um, so these solutions have to be adapted. Once we acknowledge that people have different lived experiences, then we have to have different solutions for different people understanding that one size does not fit all. I was really um, interested in Clint's uh, yesterday morning. He had that typology sort of by, I, I still have to think about it a little bit. It's gonna take a few more sleeps before it really bakes in. But this idea of one of the ways that we organize is between centralized and decentralized. And I think this is really important because as we live in modern cities, we are sort of defaulted towards this idea of centralization and efficiency. And that centralization is the most efficient way to fill in the blank, deliver electrical services, deliver sewage services, deliver water services. And maybe it would be if we were all automatons, if we were all robots having the same lived experience. But when that person that's delivering that thing is different and has a different experience, then maybe that one size fits all just doesn't work. Maybe we have to completely rethink the way we structure our physical systems to address the different needs of different people rather than talking about things like human infrastructure, rather than trying to make this like cold inert thing more human, let's just humanize the whole system and focus on services. So that's my soapbox. Here's my, here's my happy example. I, I told you I wasn't gonna leave you with. <laughs> well, on, on a bad note about how everything is terrible. So this is one of the programs that was um, in Agra. And this program was to build household toilets. So I showed you the community block toilets. Um, and those were really hit or miss. There was just one that I found that worked really well. And I don't know if it's still working well. Um, I think I got it on a, on a good month. Um, but this is these are household toilets. This was a program that really went in and uh, was based in the community. They asked all sorts of questions. Um, and one of the reasons that the household toilet works in this scenario is that it meets everyone's needs or everyone's understanding of the problem. This is, again, another stream of data. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But the people giving the money, so the government organizations, the aid organizations, have ways of understanding the problem, that open defecation is a problem of contagion, it's a problem of river pollution, it's undignified, et cetera, et cetera. So they have a whole list of like sort of problems they're trying to solve. And for the community members, the problem they're trying to solve is inconvenience. It's really inconvenient to go to a defecating ground, right? So it just takes too long. You have like 10 kids, you're trying to get them out the door in the morning, you got a sick parent living with you, maybe you're pregnant, whatever it is, it's really inconvenient to go to the field. And so the household toilet solves all of, all of those actors' problems. And so in some ways it masks the differentiation of understanding of the problem, um, but it worked. And so what we, we saw in this community is that every single person in the community except one wanted a toilet um, and the people who had them were using them. In fact, there were some families or some households that were so big that they were trying to get a second one because during those like really busy morning times, um, they, they just couldn't wait in line, like wait in line, line in the toilet. Um, my niece is 16, and so my brother-in-law and sister-in-law are like, we need more than one bathroom. Um, so it's, they have the same problem in, in India, <laughs> is that they're just, the line is too long in the morning. So um, this is a really good example of how when we're thinking about what the community needs and offering it to them in a way that's useful, everyone's needs can be met. And so I think there is a way to do this. It takes more time. It's difficult to evaluate. It's a lot more difficult to evaluate service delivery than it is to sort of like trace like miles of road on a map. Um, and so it's, it's messy. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is that um, 
actually, you know what, I'll leave that. I'll leave this on the happy note. Um, so this was something, something that works. I'm happy to talk about um, some details of this later, but um, this is my call for everyone to stop talking about infrastructure without talking about service delivery. Okay, everyone hear me all right? Um, I'm Andrea Marston. I'm in the geography department here. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming out this morning and for everyone who's online. Um, it's really great to talk here today. So I'm going to start off in a way that's very similar to Angie, which is by reminding everyone of our assignment in this panel, which I also struggled to stick to, which was to dream up a utopian solution to climate change. Um, and I was specifically told it didn't have to be practical, it just had to be something that could guide future conversations about practicalities. And I am emphasizing that because everything I'm going to say is very speculative. Um, I, am the, I was very surprised to be invited to speak here because I'm not someone who talks about utopias very much or very easily. Um, so this was a challenge for me uh, as much as anything. And I think, um, well, I'm happy to talk more about that. But I'm just starting with my actual research on the ground and then I go very quickly out from there to think about the implications for the topic of the panel. Um, and the main point I want to make today is really about um, renewable energy technologies and how to not treat them as the solution to climate change. And I'm framing these as a technical fix, and much like Angie was talking about how we shouldn't focus on infrastructure, but rather on services, my main takeaway today is about not focusing on renewable energy technologies as the solution, but rather as a tool in, embedded in more systemic, social, political, and economic change. Um, so I am going to start off by saying a little bit about my research, um, and this is just to give you a sense of where I'm coming from and why the utopia I'm talking about has the particular contours that it does. So since 2012, I've been working with small-scale tin miners in the Bolivian highlands. And when I say small-scale, what I mean is that there aren't any mining companies, either private or state-owned, in the area. Rather, there are just groups of independent miners who have banded together to form collectives that are called cooperativas mineras, or mining cooperatives, um, and it, they collectively work the resource deposit. These cooperative miners work in a tin mine that was officially abandoned by the state and private interests in the 1980s. And you can see the ruins of one of these mining structures on the surface in this image on the right. Um, the miners continue to extract small profits from the mine's subterranean depths with hand tools, drills, and dynamite, such as the one pictured in the image on the left. And a lot of my research has been spent underground, thinking about the experience of mining, um, what it's like, the kind of politics and economic projects that come from having spent several generations working in the underground to extract a resource that is so fundamental um, for so much of what we do here in, in the rest of the world. Um, but tin is not a metal that you hear very much about in the news, so you might not know that tin prices are currently at an all-time high. Um, if you look at this graph, you can see that tin prices were low through much of, throughout much of the 80s and 90s, which is really when all those major companies shut down in Bolivia. Then they went back up in the early 2000s with a commodity boom and kind of started to come down around 2012, which is when I started working there. And then in the last few years, or the last three years, they've just taken off um, at an all-time high right now. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this, most recently connected to the pandemic, which has created supply chain issues for just about all resources, um, but also has a specific connection to the things that tin um, is being used for today. While historically tin was used for things like food preservation and military attachments, now its number one use is in solder, which is that metallic glue that holds everything else together, everything from cars to circuit boards, it's in our cell phones, our computers, our appliances, um, in all electronics. And so as demand for electronics increases, necessarily demand for tin will increase as well. Most importantly for this talk, tin is needed for renewable energy technologies. Beyond its use in solder, tin is needed for lithium ion batteries, large scale energy storage, expanded energy grids, and energy efficient building materials. And I started this story with tin because that's where my own interest in renewable energy metals originated. But tin certainly is not the only element seeing a spike in demand in connection to its renewable energy technologies. 
And it's also not the metal with the largest spike, not by a long shot. This map, which was created by Earthworks, tracks the flow of metals and minerals most needed for the renewable energy economy, um, including lithium, cobalt, nickel, and manganese. Uh, it also importantly shows the limited market for end products of these flows. Lithium ion batteries are produced and consumed primarily in the global north, as you can see in those black arrows near the top of the map. Um, even though all of their inputs are sourced almost exclusively from the global south. And one way we might think about renewable energy technologies is as a technical fix. Technical fixes are attempts to solve huge problems with new technologies rather than systemic social change, very bluntly put. And the major critique here is that it doesn't address underlying issues. So you might reduce carbon or greenhouse gas emissions, but you don't really solve the rampant consumerism that's actually driving an increase of emissions over time. In this case, I also want to point out how technical fixes can create new problems in different places that aren't necessarily benefiting from the fix itself. To give the most obvious example, the increased demand for electric vehicles in North America can increase demand for lithium mining in Bolivia and conflicts around lithium mining in Bolivia. Since technical fixes have such uneven geographic effects, and I'm a geographer here, so this is where I, my interests come from, they can exacerbate climate injustices on a global scale. Some communities are disproportionately ex exposed to harms while the benefits of the fixes accrue in other places. Some scholars and activists have started to talk about climate colonialism, which describes how the same places and peoples who experience the worst effects of colonialism are also asked to bear the greatest burden, burden in, challenging, um, in the challenging transition um, to renewable energy. So I'm getting back to the utopia question here finally. So what is to be done? I want to suggest that talking about a utopian vision for any particular place on the planet makes absolutely no sense unless that place is understood through its global linkages. Technical fixes have global impacts, always, via their value chains, among other things, but these global impacts are usually underplayed or denied. Instead, I think a good starting place for thinking about a climate utopia would be to acknowledge that any local change will have far flung reverberations and that those reverberations should be incorporated in the planning process from the beginning. Specifically, I want to suggest that a global approach to resilience should work first to ensure that the benefits and harms of energy transitions are evenly experienced and i'll say a little bit more specifically about what i'm thinking here. And second, a global approach to resilience should embed technological changes within larger social transformations, by which I mean political, economic, legal, sociocultural, and so on. And in this talk, I'm just going to say a few words about possible legal changes and possible economic changes that I think should supersede or at the very least proceed in lock, lockstep with um, any technological change. So there are many ways that we might imagine redistributing the benefits um, in, in an energy transition, and the important thing is to have um, a, and the important thing is to have this as a principle that guides all political action that there should be a redistribution of benefits. But I'll mention three forms that I think um, might kind of be incorporated into this practice. First, the global north should be investing as much or more in overhauling infrastructure in the global south as it does at home, since the cost of establishing solar fields and wind farms, not to mention overhauling electrical grids and creating new energy storage systems, are prohibitively expensive. Second, I think it would be useful to think about siting manufacturing facilities alongside or at least in the same countries as extractive sites to avoid the all too common scenario in which resource rich countries export raw materials only to later import um, the final goods at a significant markup. This has been the history in Bolivia with tin for the last hundred years and it does not need to be repeated. Third, and this is obvious yet rarely done, renewable energy projects should be accompanied by knowledge transfer and capacity building, specifically through investing in higher education programs that um, are relevant to the renewable energy economy. This would help mitigate the imbalance of expertise that is currently the situation about, around renewable energies. 
When it comes to redistributing harms, this is actually much more challenging when many of the resources that are needed for renewable technologies or renewable energy technologies are just, they're not located in the places with the highest demand like Europe and North America. Moreover, when extractive projects do get going in North America, they tend to be disproportionately cited on Native American and indigenous lands, which is an example of that process of, cl cap of climate colonialism at work. So the first principle um, here should be to prioritize the local right of refusal. If there's a new copper deposit discovered that falls within the traditional or sovereign lands of a community that wants to leave that metal in the ground, that should be honored. If an extractive project is accepted, planners and investors need to prioritize environmental mitigation and economic diversification. The former is obvious and people are used to talking about it, but the second is equally important to stave off the negative, the very long-term negative effects of extractive boom-bust cycles. Where I work in Bolivia, for instance, the reason people are still mining today is because mining was the only job in town for three generations and it was, there were no other options available. Finally, while we can't necessarily move the ore deposits around the world, we can be sure to invest in recycling projects in the global north. While a lot of the world's electronic recycling currently happens in places like India, China, and Ghana, the harms generated by these industries can be more easily redistributed than the harms generated by mining. So those two slides were about redistributing the benefits and harms of energy transitions. And these next two slides will be about embedding technological change within broader social transformations. This slide focuses on legal changes and, that might be undertaken, um, but this is probably the most speculative slide in the presentation. I'm really just asking some questions that I think ought to be asked at this time. The first one is this question about who or what has rights. Oh, shoot, did I get back? Oh, that was supposed to pop up slowly, but it didn't. Okay, so the first question is one about who or what has rights. In our current liberal judicial system, individuals and corporations have rights, but what about communal rights, um, which are currently extended to some indigenous and minority communities worldwide? Is this a model that might be extended to other formulations of community, and what would that look like? Um, and the second one is about rights for nature, which are currently recognized in a handful of countries, including um, Bolivia, Ecuador, and New Zealand. If this fr framework were more generally extended, would it transform our approach to climate mitigation? The second question is about how to enforce ethical responsibility beyond the nation state, when the nation state is really the only force with any legal teeth in our current planetary arrangement. While mining companies are unrolling ever more sophisticated corporate social responsibility programs, these tend to be significantly more comprehensive in the global north than they are in the global south. There's a lot more oversight, people see what's going on, it's more visible and things tend to happen. Um, and it's really up to any individual company whether it chooses to follow through. So how does one rework legal jurisdiction for commodity chains? I truly believe that the burden to choose an ethical product should not be on the consumer, who never has all the data on hand, but should instead be with a regulatory body. What that regulatory body looks like, however, is an open question. And now we get to this slide, which is economic transformations, which I think is probably the most important piece. And for me, the most important principle to adopt here is a degrowth economic model in which the goal is less production and consumption rather than more. And this is a huge fundamental challenge to our current economic system since capitalism is based on the principle of continuous growth, which in turn demands a continuous search for new energy frontiers. Thinking about what an alternative economic system might look like, I actually think should be an underlying goal of all environmental advocacy. So in my utopia, economic degrowth is accompanied by a return of land to indigenous communities and reparations to communities that are currently experiencing the worst effects of climate change, which are often the same communities owed reparations for centuries worth of enslavement and or colonialism. The term climate reparations, like climate colonialism, is one that I think ought to circulate more in environmental planning conversations. I'll also give a quick shout out to global debt forgiveness since debt is what keeps many countries in cycles of extraction and contraction as they wrestle to resolve mounting economic crises. But the main point I would like to make here is that regardless of how the economy is rethought, renewable energy should be embedded within that system. It should be seen as one of many tools, not as the solution. 
And by way of conclusion, I just want to briefly return to Bolivia to underscore the ambivalent impacts of renewable energy technologies. Although tin mining and mining in general have had devastating impacts in Bolivia over the last 500 years, the small scale miners I work with are generally overjoyed about the rising tin prices and particularly by the increasing overtures by foreign and private companies um, who want to come and work and help them, partner with them to work in their mine. At the same time, however, they are concerned about what will happen when prices fall. Will the companies and the state abandon the region in the same way that they did in the 1980s? My point here is that the production of renewable energy technologies can have positive effects on distant economies. This is not necessarily an all bad story. Nevertheless, these positive effects can only ever be ephemeral unless they are integrated into more systemic and more global social change. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> um, just make sure I'm doing this right. Okay, great. All right, so I'm excited, as everyone else expressed, the excitement about being here uh, today uh, and uh, definitely being a part of this uh, shared experience with everyone. So I want to just jump right into it. Um, <clears throat> I want to mention that uh, urban agriculture lays the foundation of the work that, um, that I do through NORC Science and Sustainability Inc., or NORC SAS, as its founder and managing director. Uh, since 2012, with little to no financial resources, we've managed to make an impact in our community by implementing various initiatives to increase awareness of environmental, ecological, and wellness issues through educational programs and hands-on activities, such as creating community gardens and urban farms. This involves healthy food access, ecological construction, advocating for strong policy that protects the long-term sustainability of our green spaces, and the creation of a green economy. We achieve this through collaboration and partnerships with residents, community-based organizations, and other key stakeholders, including local businesses. The most valuable resource on this planet is the human mind. It was someone's ingenious thinking and collaboration with others that allows us to use a cell phone, uh, the internet, drive cars, fly in airplanes, turn on a light switch, you name it. Collaboration is the growth of stuff. It is an organic practice for humans and also occurs in nature. In agriculture, we often use a technique called companion planting. This is the close planting of different plants that enhance each other's growth or protect each other from pests. For instance, green beans are a great choice to grow with corn because corn provide much needed nitrogen in the soil. In turn, the beans, which is a vine plant, can use the corn stalks as a support system instead of requiring a trellis. With companion planting, the farmer can combine the characteristics and elements of these plants to aid in better growth. Within this ecosystem or community of interacting organisms, uh, there are no silos or hoarding of resources and information. Because as farmers, we learn that by working in collaboration, we create new ideas and creative ways of solving shared problems. By working in collaboration and sharing knowledge, we're able to create methods and technologies that allows us to extend the growing season and produce a bountiful harvest. Core values are also known as guiding principles because they form a solid core of who we are, what we believe, and who we want to be going forward. Values form the foundation when establishing a healthy environment and relationships. So these are the guiding principles of my organization and I use these values to help guide me through the process of creating community green spaces. The one that stands out the most for me is to always be concerned with the, well, the health and integrity of your family, community, and environment. It's important that we demonstrate uh, the harmonious relationship between people, nature, and community. 
All right, so uh, by raise of hands, whether virtually or here in person, <laughs> how many of us uh, ended the year 2019 with major plans for 2020? I know I did. <laughs> well, it's a saying that if you ever want to hear God laugh, tell her your plans. How many of us uh, remember Hurricane Sandy? Uh, this is actually an image from the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy in 2012. Hurricane Sandy and so many other climate-related disasters, especially now with the coronavirus, has forced us to change the way we look at things and function as a society. It's unfortunate that it's usually, it usually takes something this drastic for us to consider change. We are highly radical and proactive when it comes to getting the latest cell phone or buying a new car, but when it comes to our social systems, we are very stagnant. As farmers, we are constantly, constantly looking out for new threats to our crops and experimenting with new methods and technologies to increase our yields and extend our growing, growing season. We are constantly adapting to change. Many times, unexpected threats to our ecosystem, it actually allows us to recognize our weaknesses and help us become more resilient. I remember going to the supermarket in North uh, the morning after Hurricane Sandy. There were power outages, uh, so a generator was used uh, to pro provide some lighting so we could uh, do our shopping. And then when I took my groceries to the cashier, the cashiers uh, were computing our groceries with a calculator. And if you did not have cash, you could not buy your groceries. You just simply couldn't eat. Later that same day, I went to the garden to assess the damage, and to my surprise, <laughs> the garden had a tremendous growth spurt because the storm released much needed nutrients for plants to thrive, such as rainwater. Uh, also, lightning releases nitrogen. The question is, how can we as humans that are guided by a monetary system live harmoniously with nature? As self-help and spiritual author and motivational speaker, the late Wayne Walter Dyer stated, when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. This was a vacant lot in the city of Newark that we adopted in 2015. I, along with nearly 50 others, operate within Newark's Adopt-A-Lot program, where residents are invited to transform unused city-owned lots into gardens by leasing out the site for a dollar. Jersey City also has an Adopt-A-Lot program. I believe Trenton may have something similar. I was in search for a lot with uh, my, and my colleague, excuse me, uh, Jacqueline Beto, sent me here to this space. Now this isn't the only vacant lot in this particular neighborhood. Uh, this area is also littered with crime, poverty, and neglect. As I stood in this space, making my observation on how to transform this environment into a garden, my initial thoughts were to leave. <laughs> But as I was standing there and preparing to act out on my thoughts, I noticed a group of children walking out of the building adjacent to this space. It turns out that this facility that you see is a childhood learning center. And at the time, they didn't have a playground. The instructors would line up the children and then walk them around the block as a means to give them some outdoor activity. And that's when I said to myself, we can do better than this. So I began to see this space from a different lens. Just like without the proper nurturing, we limit a plant's growth. Without the proper environment, we limit a child's growth. We limit our own growth. In order to get the most out of anything, we have to put the best of us into its creation. And so we transform this space into the garden of hope. It is our belief that gardens in and of themselves are the real life symbols of hope. Our gardens invigorate people's senses during the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle. We've been able to transform abandonment into sustainability. The gardens become a gathering place where strangers become friends and to ponder their thoughts amongst the beauty of the garden. We have brought about a true sense of community through the natural unifier of food. And through our farm-to-table co-op, we ensure that 
the food we grow reaches the tables of the people in the community. Seeing what we could accomplish with the Garden of Hope, we decided to take it a step further by implementing all the aspects of organizational gardening to creating the city of Newark's first year round sustainable urban farm with a hydroponic greenhouse that will collect rainwater for year round food production, an outdoor commercial kitchen to support our nutrition and culinary initiatives. We'll also have a walk in cooler where we can store produce we harvest, a weekly farm stand, a few chickens some solar technology to help offset some of our energy expenses, and an enclosed facility with a restroom where we can not only host meetings, but also display and sell some of our value added products. We transformed a vacant lot into a community garden that soon will become an agricultural hub to support the 30 local growers within our network and ecopreneurs by developing new products for various markets. We started this journey in 2015 and it hasn't been easy, but we created a plan with actionable steps and moved with purpose. As founder and lead facilitator of the Newark Community Food System, I work in collaboration with a network of about 30 Newark-based growers. After acquiring three vacant lots from the city of Newark, I decided to create a land tenure and policy working group and managed to persuade others within our network to transition themselves from leaseholder to landowner as a means to secure the long-term sustainability of our green spaces. In the spring of 2021, we collectively submitted several de uh, development proposals to the city of Newark with the hopes that they will allow us uh, to purchase and redevelop uh, the lots that we're currently using. These proposals speak directly to healthy food access, climate change, affordable, energy efficient housing, and environmental justice. For example, this is uh, taken from a proposal that I submitted for redevelopment. We call this the Ashe Farmers Market and Cafe. Ashe being used as an acronym for art, science, and education, where the lower level will be a um, rustic cafe style a farmer's market, second level shared office space, third level a few apartments, and then a green roof. It starts by creating a uh, healthy environment where you can plant your first seed and give hope when others could only see despair, and begin cultivating the minds of those whom you are engaged with. I recently uh, established a, uh, a nonprofit organization uh, in Constanza, Dominican Republic. Uh, it's a mountainous town, also described as the agricultural capital of the country. And Think Globally, Act Locally urges people to consider the entire planet and to take action in their own community and city. Action Global, the organization in Dominican Republic, is a nonprofit organization we established that serves as our global outreach. Its mission is to empower communities with environmental education, facilitate the cultivation of organic agriculture, provide nutrition education, and create pathways of sustainable lifestyles and green jobs. With that, I'd like to leave you with uh, some thoughtful quotes. Robert Brought, a freelance writer, stated, if you never experience the joy of accomplishing more than you can imagine, plant a garden. As Richard Buck, Mr. Bucky Fuller, who was an American architect, systems theorist, author, designer, and inventor stated, in order to change an existing paradigm, you do not struggle and try to change the problematic model. You create a new model and make the old one obsolete. That, in essence, is the higher service to which we are all being called. And as Jock Fresco, who was an American social engineer and founder of the Venus Project stated, that if you think we can't change the world. It just means you're not one of those that will. And I like to say, think global, act local, and that's global. I thank you for your time and this opportunity. Okay. Um, well, that was, that was an amazing um, set of presentations and um, in, in trying to kind of see where there's some common threads. Torsten, your, your talk kind of gave a, a context and you ended your talk with some local actions um, and I think, uh, you know, those, those directly relate to what Tobias started talking about in terms of 
of working from a community base in terms of that kind of respect and love that that you have to make those projects actually come into play. Um, and so I think that there was a nice um, commonality there. The um, the other thing really was, uh, as writing the Tobias said, you know, differing lenses, which definitely was what Andrea and Angela were talking about in terms of, of um, instead of talking about infrastructure, talk about service delivery, instead of talking about um, uh, renewable energy as a solution, look at it as a means, and really look at the larger issues of, um, and I can't read my own writing, um, redistribution of benefits and harms, and really kind of acknowledging the exploitation and um, really addressing the issue of social transformation that is needed in this process. I also uh, greatly appreciated, because I am a gardener myself, using the garden as a metaphor um, in many ways in terms of things that you learn in the process of gardening related to um, uh, uh, taking in possible threats, addressing the threats, resilience, and how you can't garden without people. It's, it's absolutely impossible. Um, and so with that, you know, trying to kind of get this conversation going before we get some questions, and, and please feel free to um, bring questions into the chat, and I'll, I'll um, hand those over to the group. Um, I was wondering first if you also saw any kind of themes that were growing up through your projects that you would like to to highlight um, before I ask questions about inclusion and equity, which again was something that was a theme that went through all of your talks. Yes, please. I may start. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to take off the mask, but I think it's easier to understand what I say if I do so while speaking. Um, yeah, I, th I think it was a, a great set of contribution from uh, very different uh, perspectives. Uh, but as you ask, what, what is the cross-cutting uh, topic? Um, there was uh, talking about infrastructures and services for people. Um, there was, uh, it, it reminded me a lot about a discussion we have, um, particularly in shrinking cities in Eastern Germany in uh, areas with um, vastly uh, decreasing population that there is a general debate on um, minimum standards of services of general interest that the state has to provide no matter if, if you know the market would be able to to um, support it and um, the debate is on on what is the fair share that everybody should have what is the service that should be provided to everyone and um, we were still in where we are in, in in a state where there, there is a debate on that um, and of course it's controversial because in the end of course it means a lot of resources have to be invested taxpayers resources in order to provide these minimum standards everywhere and the um, debate is is definitely far from being solved um, um, interestingly, when we talk about services of in general interest or infrastructure, in the German uh, way we use the term infrastructure is by no means just physical infrastructure. Uh, we always talk about technical and social infrastructure, and social infrastructures, of course, includes uh, education, child care facilities, um, and uh, other services. And um, to Think about that uh, in both ways, in terms of demographic change as, as well as climate change. And what are the minimum standards that we should assure everywhere? Um, is, is interesting, is within Germany controversial, is of course with regard to Europe even more controversial because uh, there is um, kind of the same debate. And um, if you then take a global view as, as well, like looking at Latin America, other parts, India, um, it becomes even more challenging to say, what is it? What would we want to assure everywhere? Um, I would like to add one more point to the debate that um, I think is, is very important that may sound obvious, but um, I found that it was not obvious. That is creating awareness. Um, creating awareness about people that are affected of different developments we have talked about. And you may think is obvious, um, but let me give you just the one example of the um, Ah Valley that was uh, hit so hard by the uh, flood in July. Um, when you uh, talk to people, when you talk to mayors there, and I do a project actually right in this area since years, so I, I know the area quite well and know the, the, the planners and the politicians. And you ask, 
um, about wh why have you not been better prepared? Why the, the warning system has not really worked out? Um, one of the answers that you get is that, yes, we knew that there could be such a flood, uh, but even when the warning on short term warnings, like two hours before the flood, uh, it was out like in, in one place in the Yarra Valley, uh, so let me count in feet, it was like um, 16 feet high wave was expected. Uh, and the mayor said, no, uh, this won't happen. We have our plans. This is f worse than the worst case. It will not. Actually, it was close to 30 feet in this place. And people rationally knew they could be really hardly hit, really badly affected. Um, but the behavioral patterns learned over the past actually decades didn't tell them to, to really be prepared. And now you see people returning back and trying to fight to be allowed to rebuild, reconstruct homes that were destructed. And I, I, I'm not the, I, who I am to, to tell them, you should not build where you have lived before, maybe sometimes for generations. Uh, people call it their home. Uh, but what I think what we have to do is to create more awareness of what they can face. And that the idea that this has once been a dramatic event that will not come back during their lifetime um, is maybe too optimistic. We may uh, be, uh, or we should be prepared for, for uh, another flood of this kind there and elsewhere. And creating this awareness, I think, is still a task that has to be done in many places. I, I quite often see people maybe racially understanding that there is a risk, but in their daily behavior, they don't adapt. And, and to, to take that one step further, I, I, I think we see that left and right, that we just don't want to believe it so it doesn't happen, right? Um, but both for Angie and for Andrea's talks, you, you raise things that most people do not see, right? We do not see that toilet in India, which was not a toilet, um, right? We do not understand the plight of, of the Bolivian um, T minor, or tin minor, sorry. And so, um, you know, a lot of, Andrea, what you were talking about was in the area of policy, but we can't really create policy without people behind it backing it up. I think some of the work that you're doing with the global idea is about that kind of connectivity and how do we raise the, the risks that are, that are being experienced globally to Torsten's comment. It's not just the local risks, it's the global risks that we, by our lifestyles, are, are enabling. And so maybe, you know, maybe that's another area that we need to look at. It looks like Angie has something she wants to say. Yeah, is this on? It is. Okay, so one of the things I also noticed is that we are all asking whoever our respective audiences are to be less reactive. And so we sort of see the cliff coming, um, or maybe we're <laughs> hanging on by our fingernails, depending on how much of a fatalist you are. Um, I think that what we're we're asking people to do is to be more proactive. We see this, we see these solutions, and we see things that could be good. And I, I look at the work that Tobias is doing in Newark, and I think this is so generative, um, and it's so positive. But it, I think, for a lot of people, it looks like an extra. It looks like a bonus. It doesn't really seem to be um, systemic. And so, how do we change that way of thinking so we're not reacting to something bad, or we're not talking about flooding that's already happened, or we're not talking about a response to Sandy? We're not talking about a response to something where, you know, I mean, these things that are invisible for people who live in who, who live in the north, we're we're talking about infrastructure that fails, and we're only mad when it fails after a storm. You know, I think about Ida and how we were inconvenienced. And if we start to look at service delivery, it allows us to look long term in terms of inequality and unevenness, but it also looks allow, allows us to respond to acute events better. So it's like, it, are we delivering services of whatever? It's always electricity in urban areas because that undergirds all the other services. Um, my boiler went out in my basement and because I didn't have electricity, I could, whatever. So electricity is often, often the baseline, um, but how do we deliver that service in different events in different circumstances? Because everybody, when I talk about lived experiences, your lived experience is not constant, right? Like the, the parameters of your life are not in this moment, what they'll be later today or what they'll be tomorrow. And so it allows us to change the frame of how we're doing it, but it requires this being proactive instead of reactive. And I think that's something that we're all talking about here. And I think it's something we're talking about in a conference. It's sort of like, we see these things, here's the cliff. We can't just be reactive to things 
after they happen because it's too late then. We, we've missed our window of opportunity after you know, we're falling off the cliff. So let's not fall off the cliff. <laughs> And to that point, the cliff is in different places for different populations across the globe. Yeah. Some people are already off the cliff, right? Yeah, and so that becomes an even yeah, harder part. <laughs> exactly. Um, other other themes or anything anyone wants to say collectively before I answer questions? Um, so uh, watching and, and listening, um, I keep thinking about uh, education. And so we are all products of our education. And we've been um, fed this um, compartmentalized uh, education system um, designed in this very industrial climate. And so it is impossible or nearly very difficult for us to see the interconnectedness in almost anything we do uh, because we wasn't trained or conditioned that way. You know, we've never thought about how math and science are interconnected uh, in uh, language is also interconnected with uh, history and so forth. And so uh, I grew up in a household of artists, thankfully, uh, musicians, you know, painters, uh, writers. And um, I learned growing up that artists really uh, help uh, us kind of break down those barriers and see things uh, from a totally, uh, from very holistic perspective. Uh, but it's very difficult when you grow up um, uh, and you become conditioned in this com compartmentalized way of thinking, um, and then uh, all your friends start thinking the same way as you, uh, because you only hang out with lawyers because you're a lawyer. You only hang out with teachers because you're a teacher, and so forth. Um, and then um, we expect everyone to process information the same way as we do, uh, which is impossible. And so there needs to be a massive re-education process uh, throughout our society. And uh, we have to remind ourselves that we are the products of this compartmentalized, uh, narrow way of thinking. I didn't realize this until I, I started living uh, abroad. And so in 2019, I started traveling back and forth from the Dominican Republic and the Philippines. Um, I had no concept that you know hot water is a luxury. I didn't know that uh, power outages happens without a storm. You know. I didn't know these things. And so, um, and so when you're coming from, and you gotta be really careful about, you know, when you coming from a high income country, because then you start speaking from a very narrow perspective. Mm -hmm. And and then we start thinking the one size does fit all, right? And so um, so this is great. This, I, I didn't know anything about the toilets in India, but I still wanna go. I didn't know about the 10, in Bolivia, Bolivia, and so I like. Well, maybe I missed that market. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this is all good information, and so um, we need to do more of this. Um, but I can't stress enough that we are all products of our education, and we have to realize that we, um, uh, you know, at some point we have to realize that you know we got it wrong, and let's figure out how do we you know, create a more interconnected way of thinking and implementing some of these solutions to our problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you hear me, is this on? Okay, good. Okay, so I don't have a single unifying connection point that I wanna make, but just a couple of different things that I was thinking about when I was listening to these presentations. And the first one is just how much the infrastructure point resonated with my experience in Bolivia where infrastructure is the solution to every problem and every government that comes in makes itself or legitimates itself by building massive highways, dams. Um, soccer fields are so incredibly ubiquitous in rural Bolivia and they're you know artificial soccer fields because it's too high up for any plants to grow. There's not enough rainwater or it's just too cold there and there is no hot water and it is freezing at 12,000 feet, so different different reality for sure. Um, but then very often these infrastructure projects are not maintained or they're not um, made, they're not useful to the people. They're not the things people wanted. Schools, for example, schools, the education point, hospitals, the things that are harder to maintain continuously, they might be built, but then no one staffs them. And that's a huge problem that I think is very common throughout much of the world. 
Um, and then the other point that I was just thinking about is this, uh, well, you were commenting that some of the things that we were talking about seemed like they were more in the policy realm and less in the people realm, but these things are always connected. And you know, I thought it was interesting even in, to have these three panels disconnected with policy, people, and place because so much of what I felt like I ended up talking about was place and how to rethink mm -hmm. a place-based fix through its global connections, which is sort of also connected um, to what Tobias was talking about with everything being local at the end of the day and thinking about that is important, not because it brings in a new dimension, but because it is always global. It's just that we have blinders um, and we're taught, or the things that we see, the advertising campaigns, don't necessarily don't necessarily make apparent the ways in which we're connected to so much of the world around us, um, and so yeah, I guess this is the raising awareness point too. I'm just making connections across the board because exposing those things are um, a huge part of the project of I think researchers and people who are researching not just for the academic conversations, but for a broader conversation. It, it, whenever you do the Venn diagram, you know, the people place, you, you're, you're trying to find the middle, right? Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I, I may take, uh, uh, pick up once more the, the infrastructure topic and relate it to the, to the recent flood in, in Germany because um, is it, is it, indeed is interesting. What we see now, uh, state action is very much focused on the infrastructure, the reconstruction of the infrastructure. And um, the way they do it is, um, of course, is, is not, um, not, not stupid. Uh, for instance, um, every road, every uh, rail track, every gas pipeline was completely destroyed in the valley. And with the gas, um, of course, the heating is connected, winter is, is ahead of us, and so it's a real issue. And uh, they, they try to have some temporary solutions now first, and then they want to build the gas pipelines in a way that, so uh, before the flood was running through the valley, which is the easiest way to build it, but if the flood goes through the valley and this one pipeline is all just in the valley, you just everything is gone. That's what happened. And now they want to have the pipeline uh, more resilient by uh, um, having uh, site pipelines going down the slopes to, to reach the different villages in the, in the valley. So that, that's fine. And yes, you need to do it. But it's all about these infrastructures. How long does it take to rebuild this road? How long does it take to rebuild this bridge? How basically every bridge is destroyed. Um, and what is also done is like, where do we allow reconstruction where we can't allow because of the risk of flooding? That's a very simple idea of, so here's allowed, here's not allowed. Um, what we do not talk about is what is allowed what kind of use would be allowed if 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 it's non-restricted everybody every, everything can can be done and that's too simple um for instance um one of the very sad um outcomes of this this flood was there was a, a home for handicapped people um in in the valley um at the end of the valley actually not far from the river it was a nice location uh, but these handicapped people were trapped and basically everyone died in this structure in this night um, because what we do as a kind of flood prevention policy is just to say here you can build, here you can't build, no matter what. But that is important, how we use it. And so the, the idea of uh, the reconstruction now, again, is very simple. Uh, we have just this binary uh, decision, are we allowed to build or not? And if we're allowed to build, you can basically do what you want. And that's far too simple. We need to think far more about the people. and coming back to my presentation also about future population. Who will be the people in 10, 20, 30, 40 years that may live there and may be hit by the next major flood? And um, there is not much consideration of that. It's, it's a very simple um, approach. And I'm not saying um, not stupid because these engineers think about how to make the infrastructure more resilient but they don't think about the people that will live there in 10 or 20 years. It's because they're engineers. When you have a hammer, everything is like a nail. If they had asked a social scientist, they might have had a different solution. Absolutely. Right. That's, 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 that's uh, the lack of collaboration. You know, when you're just uh, sitting in a room with everyone who, who's taught and trained and thinks like you, well, you're going to get I mean, how you know, long term do you think that solution is going to be if you're not including 
other disciplines, uh, other, uh, you know, not even the communities involved in the, the conversation. Like, I don't know anything about a sewer system. I just want to say, I don't want it in my backyard, you know? And, and I think you want it underground. <laughs> yeah. And the other the other big issue, though, is is that it's not we no longer live in a in a what what people perceive as a binary world. All of the solutions are, you know, in, in, in a conversation. There's no one thing. It's not right or wrong. It's all in, in that other zone. I want to read you a couple of things that have come in um, from Harmut, Harmut Rausch um, says, isn't it a typical answer that when people have survived a catastrophe but lost home and property after a climate disaster, that they will proclaim to come back stronger out of this? Instead of considering a change in attitude, they will reinforce their resilience by competing with the impact of the next cat catastrophe, sure to come and not considering another defeat against the forces they can't control. The behavior is not rational, but plays into, sorry, I gotta get down to it that plays into the concept of American exceptionalism. So that's not a question, but it was really well stated. Um, but it's also the idea of man dominating nature, right? So the, yeah. there's this whole theme of, are, do we live in harmony with, are we part of, or do we try to dominate? And, and anyway. No, I mean, to your point, it's like, you know, there is such thing as natural law and we refuse to work within natural law is always, uh, and a lot of it, again, is because uh, we are so indoctrinated into a monetary system. Uh, we are looking at the quickest, easiest, cheapest way to do things, um, and it has nothing to do with nature at all. And most times, people, it doesn't have anything to do with people. I mean, uh, a lot of architects, they are trained to design things without people or nature in mind at all. You know? Yeah, take off your masks because Robin Lashenko has said that it's hard to hear y'all. Okay. <laughs> oh, I, and I would just add that regardless of whether it's American exceptionalism or sort of a narrative about man or humans dominating nature, it doesn't mean it's fixed and unchanging. Like we can work against that sort of sense of what it means to be an American, American facing a hurricane or what it means to be an, someone anywhere facing a tragedy. How, what the the knee-jerk response doesn't have to be unchanging over time. We can be part of changing that response. And as you said, the change might be degrowth as the change. Um, there is a comment from um, Dr. Anita Bakshi. Thank you, Tobias. Your work is inspiring as always. Wondering if you have an update um, on if others in NCFS have, had, have been able to move um, from leaseholder to landowner and if the city has been receptive to any of the project proposals put forward, um, which is an important issue because in terms of equity, um, this issue of, of you know, year to year leases versus land ownership is a, is a key factor. So um, one, uh, an adopt a lot program, I don't care what city it's in, it's not, uh, it's, it's not designed for long-term sustainability. It's just a quick fix. It's almost like a squatter's lease uh, program uh, until they're able to get that property back on the tax market so the city can profit from it. Um, and, um, and so uh, every city is different. Every municipality is totally different. Operating in the city of Newark, especially when it comes to redevelopment projects, it is a it's like the wild, wild west, you know? Um, you know, whoever draw that gun first. <laughs> Um, and so this has been uh, a very um, um, roller coaster ride, tedious process. Uh, I'm not the one to uh, tap out of a fight until I just know I can't. <laughs> so I just know there's no way of winning. But um, and so I'm in it for the long term. Uh, it's been a very uh, slow build, and so I am looking at different ways of uh, using, um, you know, uh, PSA announcements, uh, short videos. I am the type of person that's trying to figure out how can I tap into people's um, senses so they can see the benefit of these uh, initiatives that we're trying to put out. And so we reached out to the, uh, to the city of Newark a few times uh, and politics. And so we're very proactive. You got a crack on your phone screen, you will get that fixed right away. Uh, but when it comes to uh, social changes, um, very stagnant. And so 
hopefully with the completion of the year-round sustainable urban farm project that we're doing, uh, this would allow people to be able to process that information from their perspective and see the benefit of it and want to move much faster on the several other proposals that has been submitted. All right. Um, there's no questions. Sorry, there's no questions um, on the chat right now. Is there anyone in the room that has a question? Oh, yes, please, Meredith. You have to come up here so people can hear you. Well, <laughs> or he can run to you. Just just because everyone everyone in the world. <laughs> This, this is a question to any of the panelists. Um, it's a thought and then a question. Um, I'm super interested in, in the sort of visioning process that you all had for the sort of way in which you attack problems like this, particularly in places where folks have limited financial resources. And as, sort of, as I contemplate in my own life, how many sacrifices I'm gonna have to make over the next several years to scrape together the money to buy an electric car, it, is, it dawned on me that so many of the strategies seem to be put in out in ways that seem the least accessible for the most number of people. So mm -hmm. as you kind of went through this process where you were thinking about sustainable futures, do you have any thoughts about ways that we can kind of wrestle these great ideas sort of out of the maximizing profit space and make it more accessible to greater numbers of people? vote I, I think you need to vote um so i'm sure you vote I, that wasn't that was the universal you not the you you um but i think that most people that that work in the climate space understand that individual action will, is insufficient and so yes do all the things you know change your light bulbs get the electric car you know demetify your diet all those things but even if everyone did that it's not sufficient we need big, high-level change that will only come at the policy level and at the national policy level. So these big, so governments do things or are supposed to do things that individuals and small communities can't do alone. Um, ideally, that's what the government does. They are able to marshal resources and um, organize things in ways that smaller numbers of people can't. And so for, for better or for worse, they have that level of power and that's the level of change that we need. And so um, I think it's wonderful when people are willing to do things, but I really, it, I hate to hear people say things like they have to sacrifice because we should be able to live a good life and still care for the planet. Um, the fact that this is being framed as an individual sacrifice solution or situation, I think really is unfortunate. And um, I think that we need to, put the responsibility where the solution lies, and that's in our government. And I know that's like a super policy wonk thing to say, like, and I'm, I'm sorry for that, but, <laughs> but I don't think this is gonna happen without large sweeping policy. Um, and so um, vote and make other people vote or make voting cool, as cool, <laughs> cool as policy can be, right? <laughs> um, and, and get involved, get involved in politics at all levels, whether that's local or all the way up to national levels. But we have to do this um, at a policy level. Like it cannot, cannot be done on an individual level. So great for you for trying to do this, but you should not feel like your life has to suffer to, 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 to deal with climate change. <laughs> do I ask you to say something? Yeah, so uh, I'm a grassroots uh, organizer and I use that approach uh, in just about all the work I do. I am uh, I'm not a political organizer. And I, one of the things that when I'm organizing with people, I say, look, we have to operate from our strengths. I don't want you to do what I do and don't expect me to do what you do. Um, and we have to approach this from all different uh, angles. And so if you are, and so I lend a voice, I'm constantly lending uh, a voice to uh, political organizers, especially in the uh, environmental justice work. And, um, but I'm saying, don't expect me to march down the city hall with you because I just, it's just not what I do. I like to implement the solution. Um, and that's just, that's just my personality, right? And so uh, if we begin to kind of realize what our strengths are, allow ourselves to focus on those strengths 
and then allow others who are stronger in our weak weaknesses, mm -hmm. allow them to do that work that they do, but we do it collectively and, and work in collaboration. And that's not easy for everybody because not everybody know how to work in collaborations uh, because um, uh, everyone wants to say they're the ones who ended homelessness or ended poverty, you know? <laughs> And that is just bananas. It's like, you know, it's just crazy. And so, um... it, but it is, it is again, it's an important issue in terms of giving everyone voice and, and respect right. in the different ways that they work. I'm sorry, you go right, right ahead. No, I was just, well, first of all, yes, totally agree with the question asker that the way that so many solutions to climate change have been put forward are these big, economic purchases that individuals are supposed to be making in order to adapt to some kind of like climate friendly lifestyle that I, and I totally agree with Angela is not going to solve anything, even if everyone were individually scrimping and saving to make these, you know, sacrifices, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the silver bullet that it's, um, you know, framed as. And I think what Tobias is pointing at that I think is really important is not to frame it as a dichotomy between individual decision making and policy making, but rather to focus on these meso level scales of organizing that are community oriented, that are city oriented, that um, draw on long histories of already working towards collective causes. When I think about the work that I do in Bolivia, the small scale miners I work with have over a century of uh, working together, most of them are, um, are indigenous identifying from the regional Ayus, which are the indigenous territorial organizations, but they've also been union miners for about 50 years. And these multiple layers of histories um, are their strength that they draw on in the contemporary moment when they're making demands on the government and when they're asking um, things of individual community levels at the uh, community members. So that level becomes the um, the thing that shifts the balance in one way or another. Thank you, Torsten. Yes, I would like to, to uh, at least try to answer uh, the, the the question. I'm um, completely convinced that market will not solve the problem that we face with regard to climate change and demographic change. Um, of course, we need policies. Unfortunately, nation is not enough. It has to be supranational. It has to be global. And um, we all see that actions taken, policies uh, in, in place, uh, by far not enough that uh, what, what would be necessary. In the long run, I'm also convinced that mitigation would be far, far uh, more affordable than adaptation. The, mm. the cost of adapting to climate change will increase dramatically. And uh, yes, there are a lot of uh, communities, a lot of individuals that cannot afford to adapt to what was going on. And they need assistance, they need support, uh, a lot of support. And uh, these uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods are also individuals that cannot just uh, adapt. We, we see it actually everywhere, um, even with regard to you know the, the simple measures like uh, protecting your home against uh, flood risk or something. Um, if you have money, you can do it. And the better some communities do or some, some homeowners do, the worse it gets for others that cannot do it. And um, that, again, is, is a task for policies to, to uh, make sure that there is a fair um, uh, distribution of possibilities and, and, and the capacity to adapt. But um, as I said before, I think mitigation is the better strategy than adaptation. Well, we need to do both, but uh, focusing on, on mitigation would be more important. And, Unfortunately, the, the speed of learning in society, of changing um, routines, of changing learned behaviors, seems to be far lower than the speed of change that we see in the climate, that we see in other uh, things. So I'm not all too optimistic, I must say. Uh, but um, yeah, we, we need policies to, to uh, help um, um, to, to turn the tide and to, to get in the right track. Great. Um, well, this this concludes our time. Um, uh, actually, do you, did you have a question? You are you sure, Frank? You go ahead. You get the last word, Frank Gallagher. Just as, as sort of a way to kind of look forward on this, 
you know, we often look at the past and, and move to the future and we draw a linear uh, regression and we say it's going to take us X time to get there. And, and but I think about things that have changed over time and, you know, it wasn't too long ago I had a flip phone and now I'm walking around with an iPad Pro, you know, so 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 things can change uh, in a nonlinear fashion and, and, and perhaps I was warning from a social perspective, are we at some type of tipping point where we can turn around to our students and be optimistic about the future? What are the things mm -hmm. that really make it make it look like, you know, we can solve this problem and and, you know, uh, your future doesn't have to be that way. Nice question. And more optimistic. So we yeah, leave it as and a on a good word. note. Much Thank better. you, Frank. And well, one of my living tests are, are my relatives in Texas, and my yes. relatives in Texas don't think I'm a, a whack job for working in a climate office at a university. So that's a really good indication, right? So um, my Texas relatives don't give me the side eye when I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm working in this newly formed climate office. Um, I don't know if that means anything to anyone, but it, it means something to me. For many of us, that matters. Yes, I understand that one. Same for my in-laws in North Dakota. It's not yeah. so crazy anymore. <laughs> um, but I actually think the most optimistic part when you talk about talking to students is the students themselves. You don't have to convince students anymore about the importance of climate change. They come in with all the statistics and we can start from a very different starting place than we were at 10 years ago. That to me is the most, um, it, the biggest source of light in, in the present moment, in my daily life at least. Well, I, I believe we're um, moving towards um, world unification, um, where uh, technology uh, has um, allowed us to see that the world is much smaller than we thought. Um, and um, future generations, maybe the next generation, uh, will get their kicks out of helping making the world a better place versus trying to get a six figure uh, salary. Yeah. All right. With that, thank you all very much. This was wonderful. And as Angie said before, lots of um, food for sleepless nights to, to rethink, right, as we go on. So now it's lunchtime. Thank you all.